ingenuity to develop a way for whistleblowers to transfer information anonymously and has developed an invaluable public archive that will forever challenge the official narrative of his time and vulnerable because he's been so successfully marginalised, they can abuse his human rights and in the process curtail press freedom forever. It's unconscionable that we hold right to no protests and events in Australia where his case is not at the fore, let alone not raised at all. We've benefited from his work. We journalists, media organisations and members of the public. Today we need to stop and consider this. If our government persists in failing to intervene, a year from now he may be dead or in a US supermax prison for as long as he can bear it before taking his own life. Is this the world we want to live in? Uh, thank you. Uh... Mary, and you correct to raise all those questions because this really is the world we want to live in. But before we go into too much of that, I think we should um, throw it over to Paul. Now, Paul is a Sydney based freelance journalist who is focused on rights issues, uh, climate, and global south. He currently writes for Sydney Criminal Lawyers and was a long term contributor to Vice. And something I've noticed about Paul's work is He's quite a water carrier. Often he'll publish an article about a particular issue uh, before a lot of the mainstream press will pick it up. So I'd like uh, Paul to introduce Paul Gregoire. Oh, hi. <laughs> I'm Paul. Um, so I put together something about, uh, about uh, World Press Freedom Day. I thought I'd draw attention to how uh, Reporters Without Borders have just released the 2020 World Press Freedom Index. Um, so the organisation asserts that press freedom is being undermined globally on five fronts, aggressive authoritarianism, a lack of technological democratic guarantees, a stimming of democracy through repressive policies, a deep suspicion of the media, and a lack of quality due to economic constraints. Reporters says that all of this is being um, exacerbated by the COVID pandemic at the moment. Um, and, and this is shown where nations um, with long-term issues around press freedom, such as China and Iran, um, have been hit hardest in part due to their lack of free information. Um, as for Australia, it ranks 26 out of the 180 nations, which doesn't sound too bad until you factor in that this country dropped five places over the last 12 months. Uh, the rundown the index gives in relation to Australia is that 2019 saw local journalists become more aware of, uh, more aware than ever of the fragility of press freedom in a country whose constitutional law contains no press freedom guarantees and recognises no more than an implied freedom of political communication. So the obvious incidents that, that exposed this threat to press freedom and led to Australia dropping down in place were the um, AFP press raids on Anika Smethurst House and the Sydney ABC offices in June last year. These were carried out due to a supposed uh, threat to national security that both these reports seem to be able to oppose well after a year after they'd been published. Um, according to Reporters Without Borders, the raids were used to intimidate all investigative journalists in this country and their sources. Um, this idea is best typified by the fact that Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton has appeared in the media several times after the raid. Um, the first time was quite after uh, quite soon after they happened, and he's admitted the rumour that Smethurst published that his office wants to turn the nation's international spying agency, the Australian Signals Directorate, on domestic targets is, is certainly under consideration. However, Dutton's confirmation of this um, somehow doesn't carry the threat when he says it that Smethurst exposing it in the press did. Uh, reporters with our borders also called out the recent High Court decision regarding the raid on Smethurst House 
as the full bench of the court ruled that the warrant used by the AFP was invalid because it failed to identify the crime that um, the journalist was being investigated for. However, the court ruled that the police could keep the materials that they'd seized during the raid that used the invalid warrant, and the AFP can use these materials in their continued investigation of the matter. Um, Reporters Without Borders said in relation to this case that this in effect means that police officers can at any time with complete legality sweep on any Australian journalist's home and search it from top to bottom because of an article they write. So the outcome of that case also means that Smethurst can still be prosecuted for the crime, um, which carries two years imprisonment. Incidentally, she can't be charged under the Turnbull government's espionage legislation as that was passed after her um, article was published. But under the new laws, um, the type of offence that Smethurst would likely be charged with now carries a maximum of 15 years of prison time. So the laws are stacking up. Um, another point that Reporters Without Borders makes, which I think is important to emphasise, is that the Morrison government's climate denial and the fact that it operates in the interests of the fossil fuel industry is stifling media reporting on the issue of changing climate and, and further its continued dispersal of misinformation around the topic is hindering the progression of the national discussion around this topic. So. At the end of this, how does this all relate to um, the case of Assange being held on remand in the London prison on behalf of a foreign power? Well, if you look to the fact that the AFP raids were carried out just two months after Julian was removed from the Ecuadorian embassy, you can see three intimately linked English-speaking democratic nations working in tandem to make the point that exposing um, corruption and truths about government is not in their understanding in the public in, in interest, but rather it's to be recognised as a crime that will be prosecuted and punished in the harshest possible manner. So that's what I had to say. Uh, thank you, Paul. Well, that certainly uh, covered a lot of ground there as far as the uh, Kafkaesque lifestyle that we seem to be walking ourselves into. Uh, now, something happened to our live stream, so we don't have any questions coming in live. Uh, for the participants, if you could, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please type them into the chat and uh, I will unmute you and you can be able to ask the question. But uh, my first question, it's, it is to uh, Mary uh, in so far as, um, and, and, and then to James uh, in so far as, uh, you brought up the whole topic of how, you know, the UK, the US and Australia are crushing um, freedom of speech, yet the Australian government did speak up for against the Cambodian government when they were trying to do it. Now, some might think this is a bit of a colonialist mentality, but is there more to it or is it all about war profiteering? James, would you like to go first? Um, yeah. <laughs> Am I unmuted? Yes. Um, well, you see, in my case, and I and I try and relate my case to Julian's because there are certain parallels between the two of them. Uh, something's happened to your soundboard, Jane. Um. Well, it's not on mute, or, or maybe it is. No, no, you could. Keep going. You're good. We can. I think it's just your internet connection. Start again. Can you unmute yourself? You have muted yourself. Um, well, that was... A, <laughs> I, I should let anybody who's watching this know that this is the second time I've engaged in a, in a, in a conversation like this and I'm a, I'm a novice. So can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. All right. So in my case, for the first uh, year of my... Incarceration, and some, I can still hear somebody's got their their mic unmuted, and I'm hearing all sorts of things. Uh, are your others hearing stuff as well? No. Okay, that's that's better. Okay, so for a year, I was um, in for the first year that I was incarcerated. I'm getting a, I'm getting a noise, almost like a taxi coming through. It's your feedback. 
Oh, is it? Okay, sorry. Okay. So just just speak right. lower and it, it should be all right. Okay, all right. Um, uh, <laughs> it's disconcerting. I was, um, I was in jail for a year before the Australian government did anything to help me. Uh, the way in which they tried to help me is kind of long and complicated, but what I can reduce it to is this, that after there'd been many articles written in newspapers that were very sympathetic to my situation because it was clear that there was no evidence whatsoever that I was guilty of um, espionage, after 110,000 people had signed a, a petition to the government, uh, the government eventually did at the level of the Prime Minister, then um, Malcolm Turnbull, did intervene in my case and make efforts to have me released from uh, prison. The, the conversation that was had, and this has been confirmed from a number of different sources, and I've actually seen and have the email, um, Malcolm Turnbull, in March 2018, spoke with Hun Sen, who's the Prime Minister of Cambodia, and came to an arrangement whereby I would ultimately, after my court case, be released from prison. Now, the circumstances surrounding my release are slightly complicated, but the important thing that I learned there was that um, these matters are often uh, sorted out behind the scenes at a prime ministerial level or at the level of ministers of foreign affairs who... Um, do some kind of a deal. We'll do this for you if you'll do this for us. And, and subsequently, having spoken to various different lawyers that were involved in my case pro bono, I've discovered that in other situations where Australians have found themselves in situations similar to mine, situations similar to the one that Julian finds himself in, that high level representations have been made between prime ministers, foreign ministers and so on in order to um, solve the problem, if you like. So I know, or I, I'm convinced, I should say, that um, Scott Morrison, Maurice Payne could, if they so chose, get on the phone to their counterparts in the UK and say, um, the Australian public finds it totally unacceptable that you are keeping Julian Assange, a publisher, a journalist, in jail for having committed the crime of journalism. We really would like you to sort this out and do whatever is necessary to see to it that he's um, returned to the safety of his family, to the safety of his country of birth, and that he's um, taken out of a situation, which he's in at the moment in Belmarsh Prison, where he could die of coronavirus. So I guess the important message for me is that until Australian journalists and the Australian public begin to clamour for Julian's release, um, I fear that the government will not do anything. They, they, they wouldn't have helped me if it hadn't been for public support. There was another prisoner in jail with me. I, I won't go into detail here, but there was another Australian prisoner in jail with me who became very sick. And we wrote letters to Maurice Payne and to Malcolm Turnbull saying that this prisoner is very sick. Uh, and we fear that if he doesn't get proper medical attention, he will die. Uh, the messages that we got back from the um, ambassador to Cambodia were, this is not our problem. He then died of malnutrition and neglect in Presar Prison in December 2017. Uh, now, you've never even heard of this case, I'm sure. Um, there was a tiny little story in the newspaper. Um, he didn't have the kind of public support that I had. And uh, my fear is that Julian is suffering the same fate in a way, that without the public support, the government is not going to do anything to help him. So. I guess my plea is, insofar as it has an effect, is for people to um, pressure their journalists of choice, their local member, um, the Prime Minister, Maurice Payne, and make their voices heard in whatever way they can, asking, requesting, please um, assist Julian Assange in the same way that you assisted James Rickardson. Uh, thank you, James. Um, so he raises an interesting point there, Mary, about uh, scratch my back and I'll scratch your back. Um, what, 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 
Yeah, I mean, James raised many uh, interesting points um, and, and he's one of the people that the that our government has seen fit to step up and uh, do all it can to help at a very high level. Um, others that have been the beneficiary of this sort of thing have been uh, Pratt and Wallace uh, some years ago, uh, Peter Grester more recently and, and others. And, and currently, a woman who's in an Iranian prison, Moore Gilbert. Uh, we know that on Moore Gilbert's behalf, the uh, foreign minister has intervened and she's holding high level, you know, communicate meetings about, about her. She's concerned, Maurice Payne has put on the public record that she's concerned about uh, the charges, she doesn't accept them, she doesn't accept the conviction, um, she's concerned about the conditions that she's held and she wants her released. The family ha have said we don't want media attention, we, we'd, like to, we'd like to give an opportunity for these high level interventions uh, to work behind the scenes. Now, uh, uh, the, our government has a track record of intervening where they think, you know, this is a rogue state. Um, so it's fine to be seen in opposition to that. Uh, but they haven't uh, got a, a track record of intervening when it comes to uh, one of the countries that we see ourselves uh, as being, you know, part of this club. Um, and, and, and we're not an equal member of this club, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're subservient. So it's the United States and the UK. Traditionally, as a colony, it was to the UK that we kowtowed. Now, of course, it's to the United States. Um, and in this case, it's uh, outrageous because we're not just kowtowing, we're, we're really giving away our sovereignty. We're saying our sovereignty doesn't matter because they're using a domestic United States law to prosecute an Australian citizen, to seek his extradition. And then you've got the UK, uh, that we have this historical, very strong historical relationship with, and the, we still have their head of state is still our head of state. Uh, doing this to an Australian citizen, the question in my mind is, would the UK be giving up one of their own? Would they be giving up, you know, if they wanted Ellen Rusbridger, who at the time, you know, was publishing stories uh, based on these releases, would they give up Ellen Rusbridger? I would say, I would say not. They have picked Julian because he is the most vulnerable. They know Australia won't stand up to them. This is the problem. And if they do it to Julian, then it's a no-brainer. They can pick out anyone they want because there'll be a precedent. That's, that's the issue. So it's, it's, not just, it's not just a problem of a human being's life which is a big enough problem in itself because he's an Australian citizen and they have an obligation to protect him. It's not just about the abuse of the human and legal rights of an individual who's an Australian citizen. It's about the repercussions for press freedom. And as a number of, of uh, politicians can see who are part of this cross-party coalition, which needs to grow, um, that are representing, um, advocating for Julian's release, uh, that, that it's a sovereignty issue. We can't shy away from that. You know, if, if sovereignty is important, then we can't allow this to happen. If human rights are important, we can't allow this to happen. And if press freedom is important, we can't allow this to happen. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, I'd bring Paul into this conversation actually because he raised some interesting points about you know, the recent raids on the ABC and Annika Smithhurst and what that went to our press freedom. And I'm just wondering if, um, if, you know, if, we, if we are being worn down and, and our society is not paying attention to how this is happening. And in some ways, COVID-19 should have been an opportunity for all of us to review what works and what doesn't work in our society. Uh, yet, while that's happening to society, there's a lot that aren't paying attention. 
Paul, what are your thoughts on just where, you know, what, what we can do to uh, stand against the government's uh, continuing crushing of the media? Well, I mean, what you're saying about COVID-19 at the moment and, and that chance that we have to rethink how we want things to look like on the other side of the um, on the other side of the lockdown, I'm starting to have concerns about whether there are going to be those opportunities to make those changes, or are we going to see um, the government um, barrel us into uh, putting apps on our phones? I mean, they seem to be going down this, heading down that same avenue they're already heading down. And unless uh, the public does something to stand up and actually say we want things to change, it looks like they'll just be able to go ahead with business as usual. So, I mean, um, the app itself, while that's, that's not monitoring, you know, that's not threatening press freedoms, it is, again, stepping up the surveillance state that, that seems to be one of the major concerns of, of the government at the moment and, and you know, um, sort of eroding our freedoms further. Okay, so we've got thousands of journalists uh, across the world and, and, and hundreds here in Australia speaking up for Julian Assange and media freedoms and so on. I'm just wondering uh, why it is that the editors of our news programs and such aren't convinced to allow those journalists to have their voices to speak. I remember when um, uh, Laurie Oakes, uh, he was an old Channel 9 reporter, and he was accepting his Walkley Award in about 2010, I think it was, and he said, I'm using this platform to talk about there's no difference between receiving an envelope, a, a letterbox stuffed full of files, and it being downloaded to your thing. Now, I haven't been able, he was saying he wasn't able to talk about Julian Assange and WikiLeaks through any of his media channels, and he was using that platform to do it. I'm just wondering what 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 it is that we can do to somehow encourage the you know the program directors and the producers and the editors of our mainstream media to take these ideas on board. You know that we are walking down into a Kafkaesque uh, world of bizarre control and 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 lack of media freedom. Perhaps I can see Mary's nodding. Have you got any thoughts on that? Um, it's very, very difficult when you generate cultural change. I was at SBS from the beginning and I saw that cultural change occurring. Um, a culture is set by the person at the top. So when we vote for the Prime Minister and we vote for representatives in Parliament, that really sets, sets the scene, doesn't it? Um, because in turn, you know, they, they, they'll make appointments. So they, they, it's got, they're going to, the appointments are going to reflect their values. Um, I keep hoping that someone will come along in politics that is going to stand up and say, okay, these these are going to be the, the policies that I, I want to implement based on the principles that I believe in. Someone that will have the guts uh, and, and, and will think, well, so if I lose, I lose. But this is what I stand for. We don't have any, we don't seem to have anyone like that really because when it comes to the crunch, it's... Uh, you know, the important thing is to get that job and then once you've got it, to hold on to it. And this is why you have someone like Trump um, in the US because people are just so sick of, you know, of uh, politicians who are part of the establishment and they want something different. Unfortunately, that something different um, isn't, isn't great, but you can see that that Americans are just uh, sick of it. You know, they, they do want something different. And having proposing Hillary and proposing John uh, Joe Biden isn't, you know, it's not delivering that. So we might see Trump winning again. Um, what we need here, I think, is probably a change coming from us, from the peoples, from the bottom up. And in that sense, we need to be agitating for all our 
friends, family, uh, colleagues to go to, to talk to their political representatives because in the end what they are, the only thing that frightens them um, is, is not having your vote. Um, and, um, yeah, it's a tough, it's a, ve it's a very, very tough um, situation for someone who is uh, agitating to reveal the truth because, as you can see, it's not, you know, Julian is probably the uh, most high-profile person in this situation, but in this country we have others that are being prosecuted, um, Kaliri, David McBride and, and others, and it's important that we uh, show a lot of support for these very brave individuals um, because otherwise they're going to be able to just lock them up and... Yeah. And and then, you know, this this was the point that I'm making, is that the world that we want to live in? Clearly not. Clearly not. I've, I've got a question here from Larissa, which actually you answered while it was, uh, after she typed it. But it's talking about uh, how do you feel about, and this, this question is directed to all three of you, how do you feel about Philip Adams's the teacher from Queensland, his petition with over 400,000 signatures. Uh, now, bearing in mind that they are international signatures, but there's a fair amount of them are from here. Uh, should we, uh, she's asking what you basically said then, should we be approaching the PM, Payne and other MPs daily? Do you think this volume will work? Uh, I, I have spoken a little bit some of the team that are working on this and there seems to be a mixed approach as to what mixed feelings as to whether we should be approaching them that often or not personally i think um it's all right i think it's it's a matter of a daily occurrence but we need to be writing individual emails and they need to be polite we can't we, we, we won't capture anybody's imagination by being rude to them uh, would anybody there care to elaborate on that? James. Okay. Um, oh, God. Uh, it's, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, it's hard to know where to begin, but I'm going to begin to come at it from another angle. About last year, when I went to one of the climate change rallies in the domain, there was a huge crowd of people there. I don't know how many people there were for. There was no room for any more people. And there was going to be a march. And because I had my camera with me and I wanted to film the beginning of the march, I went to where the march was going to begin and I found that there were half a dozen policemen who were instructing the demonstrators in when and how they could march. In other words, the police themselves had taken control of the march and the organisers had basically ceded control to the police. Now, back in the 1970s at um, Springboks demonstrations and at anti-war anti demonstrations that I, anti-Vietnam war demonstrations that I attended, there was no question of asking the police's permission to do things. We wanted to demonstrate and to have our voice heard and we just did it. And that caused a lot of problems. A lot of people got arrested, including myself, and we wound up in jail for short periods of time. So, mm -hmm. My number one observation is that I think that that style of demonstrating, um, I, I won't say that it's past its use by date, but unless, unless it becomes a mass spectacle that is not controlled by the police, where um, people are so insistent that, that the, the point they wish to make is, is made, that they wind up having clashes with the police who tell them to get back onto the footpath or whatever, I don't think the media is going to pay much attention at all. As far as petitions are concerned, I, I take my hat off to Philip Adams for getting that number of signatures. And, and I have to say that the 110,000 signatures for me helped. It helped because it generated um, publicity. Uh, it... it it gave journalists something to work with in terms of supporting me. The problem with Julian is, and I suspect that everybody who's listening to this and everybody who's involved in it has had the same experience. I still, after all of this time, 
meet with intelligent friends of mine who say, I don't like Julian Assange. And they say, why don't you like him? And what's that got to do with anything? Oh, it's because of all that business in Sweden, right? So he has so effectively been um, smeared by the media itself that it's very difficult to actually get the general public to engage with Julian as a father, as a son, as a human being. All they can see him as is as someone who possibly raped some women in Sweden, possibly smeared feces on the wall, possibly misbehaved in the embassy. So whoever is behind that smearing of Julian has done a, an exceptionally good job. And, and I know from my point of view, I've had a couple of um, opinion pieces that have been published in a couple of in, in newspapers. But the last one, I was actually inv invited by a major media organisation when I was in the UK um, for Julian's hearing in February. I was invited to write an op-ed. So I wrote an op-ed, <clears throat> which was actually very critical of the Australian media. They decided not to publish it and instead publish something by Peter Grest, right? So the problem now is that because the media is the very thing that we want to criticise, which media outlets are going to allow other members of the media, people such as myself and Mary, to be critical of it, right? So one of the, one of the key things about the media is that we all have to be open to criticism. I'm sure that Mary, when she was at SBS, had people criticising her because she didn't do this right or she should, she should have done things differently. I know that I, as a filmmaker, have had people say that's one of the worst films I've ever seen, you should give up filmmaking. Part and parcel of being in the media is accepting the criticism of your peers, but it seems to me, and I'd love to hear Mary on this, it seems to me that criticism from one's peers does not exist within the ABC now, and I don't think it exists within the mainstream media. Over to you, Mary. Sorry, I, I couldn't quite... The audio is not very clear and I couldn't quite oh. um, hear the question. What's the question you're framing, James, oh. the issue? Did everyone else hear what I said? Uh, yeah, look, um, uh, you were basically talking about, you know, there's no criticism uh, of fellow journalists allowed. In yes, the, I heard that. Uh, yeah. Um, I, was just, I was just curious to know what Mary's experience has been in terms of trying to get fellow journalists, people that she's worked with, people that she knows well, um, trying to get them to engage in a conversation, part of which is criticism of journalists and journalism themselves. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's not yes, an easy to, to, to have a conversation. Yeah, no, no, obviously people are very um, defensive. Uh, oh, hang on. People are very, very defensive. Um, there was a protest recently that um, Michelle and, and Daniel Wood organised in Sydney uh, at Martin Place, and we had, uh, you know, the, all the former luminaries from the ABC, uh, uh, Wendy Bacon, um, uh, Quentin Dempster, uh, Andrew Fowler, uh, Mark Davis. These are all people that have fronted flagship programs at both public broadcasters. Not one mention in any media, none. It was astonishing, really. Um, they really don't want to run stories on anything to do with Julian unless they absolutely have to. And it gets to um, the point where really you have to just keep thinking, well, what kind of stunt can I organise because they love stunts. So do you remember Terry Hicks got into an orange suit in, in, in a cage and, and that um, brought media attention? Given this petition now has, I didn't realise it has over 40,000 signatures, I think oh, we need Julian's father or mother to show up at Parliament House and say, I'm here to see the minister. I'm here to see... Uh, the prime, well, the foreign minister. It's outrageous that Marie, Marie's Payne hasn't spoken to either of his parents. She's clearly spoken to more Gilbert's parents. She's been working with them. When I ran into her on the tarmac 
um, coincident, you know, by, by accident, uh, and put to her a number of facts about Julian's situation, uh, her response, her only response was, that's not what I hear, that's not what I hear. Well, who are you talking to, Minister? You're not. You're. You, you're clearly talking to just the one side. So we can't allow this to keep happening. We simply can't. This is the problem. They've made a decision that they will advocate for person X and not advocate for person Y. But person, both both of these individuals have families. Both of them have supporters. Both of them have rights, even if they had no family, no supporters. They have rights as human beings. Why are we letting Marie's pain get away with it? I think we need to stage some sort of event, you know, uh, and everyone needs to put their thinking caps on about what kind of stunt that needs to be. But I don't think they respond to anything uh, other than that. Uh, yeah, that does seem to be the uh, cycle of news. that would be sensational for it to mean anything. <clears throat> I think it was interesting what you're talking about, how uh, the tone of our society is very much set by the Prime Minister and the elected representatives. And I think a real lost opportunity with Malcolm Turnbull, for example, who's made all the despite being a merchant banker, he'd made all these noises about great change and then didn't do any of it, which I think has perhaps led us all, made, made the whole of society feel a bit winded by that. Uh, but until we do get somebody like that, how can we sort of uh, get the, the producers and the editors to actually sit up and take notice? Could we be making a campaign that targets them specifically about this is what's going to happen if you don't do something? Would that be I mean, I, I was, I mean, I was, uh, as as Mary said, I mean, I was struck at, at that same uh, at that protest on on February. I was struck. Uh, John Pilger made the same comment that the way forward will be um, the public speaking out. The public has to go to Scott Morrison and say we want Assange to be let out, and that's what has to happen. Uh, but I was also struck at that time when he was saying that the fact that you had Mary and John Pilger was there and all these, Mark Davis was there, all these big journalist figures were there on stage. I mean, you had all that support from, from, from the creme de la creme sort of thing. Uh, but then that media, up, sorry, that public support isn't out there. And as James was saying, that smear campaign has been done very well because I remember when uh, Julian was taken and incarcerated everyone was on social media going uh, before you know this this is an outrage but before they wrote this is an outrage doesn't matter what you think about Julian doesn't matter what you think about him over and over I was shocked at how everybody had to perceive that this shouldn't be happening with a comment on his personality um, so out there, out there in the public, the, uh, it has to be like a majority of people do think he's done something bad, and and it had, I guess it's with the, those Swedish uh, um, charges, or they weren't even charges, but you know it has been such a good smear campaign out there that everyone, there's a lot of people out there that generally must think that he's done something wrong, besides actually publishing some information, and aren't. Um, aren't ready to speak out about him or his cause. I just say, even if, if um, that's the case and you think or people think that he's done something wrong, it's about proportionality. Okay, so he's not, he's not perfect. He might have done something wrong. Does he deserve to die in prison for? Yeah, yeah. You think that he's not a very nice person or, you know, there's something about him you don't like. Do you want him to die in prison? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's just totally out of proportion, completely out of proportion. I've, of course, you know, I'm one of the people that actually like him. <laughs> and so I have, uh, 
I have I have great difficulty hearing people who, you know, they've made up their minds. They've never met him. They don't know him, but they've made up their minds. Um, that is, a, it is a big problem. I think it's improving in the sense that at least we, we're not having constant negative stories in the media about him, about the Swedish allegations, um, because they keep popping up like Jack in the Box. Uh, and there's this wonderful case on at the moment um, with uh, freedom of documents and freedom of information that Stefania Maurizi has obtained, because the Swedes, um, they have quite a, 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 a fantastic, actually, FOI environment in Sweden, so you can obtain almost any documents that you, you want. They handed over some documents that um, proved communications between the UK prosecutor and the Swedish prosecutor um, talking about the Swedish case because the Swedes wanted to, well, had to close it. And, it, you know, the, the prosecutor said, oh, don't get cold feet now. You can't do this. So the UK prosecutor put a lot of pressure on the Swedes to keep the case open. The Swedes now have seized up so they, they you know, they won't hand over any more documents because the UK has said, what? What have you done? You know, you should have asked us before you release yeah. these these documents. But we're um, finding out more and more about what now. I've lost, forgotten what the actual um, question was that I was answering. Gosh. Well, look, the, the problem is that there are so many threads to this. You know, you go off on a tangent. On you can go off on many tangents. Um, well, of course, something yes, like no, that's right. We were we were talking about um, the. Um, uh, all the smears and and this you know this is sort of um, he's, he's surrounded by this stench unfortunately but I think that that's dissipating now that it's unlikely that the the, the Swedish um, prosecutors are going to pop up again like Jack in the Box uh, and we really do we just have to keep trying to get the media to focus now that those allegations have disappeared on what the substantive issues are. And the substantive issues are a person's human rights, his legal rights, um, our moral uh, responsibility to protect him as, as an Australian, uh, and press freedom. Because once we've, once we've lost those things, then we, we've lost our humanity, we've lost democracy. Um, so it's a matter of what you know, trying to get people to focus on what is really important about the society that you want to preserve. So it's, it's, it's a lot easier, um, like you have to push through with those ideas you want to get to. Like what, what you were saying, like is this in proportion he's done something wrong should he go to jail for the rest of his life a lot of the time i think the general public aren't looking at that the second bit the out of proportion punishment and really having to drag out that what that is and these other issues i mean they have to be presented in a in a way that moves past that gut reaction I, I think something that's worth noting is um, that, aside from the fact that one of his alleged SW refused to sign any document saying she'd been raped, uh, we've all sort of overlooked the fact that it's her consent that has been violated by the state for 10 years. The other thing, of course, is, uh, as you were saying, the Swedes were starting to get cold feet and they were pressured by the English. Well, the, the, the Swedish court system was so embarrassed also by the political manipulation of it that were going on. European law has changed. So a prosecutor can no longer issue an arrest warrant the way Marion Nye did. It, it just can't happen. Um, so, so this has been a massive travesty. I've noticed the big thing that a lot of people are saying is he endangered lives. He released documents unredacted. And I really think we need to be campaigning on that because all documents were redacted. No lives were lost, as was came out in the Chelsea Manning trial. Uh, 
and, and of course, in actual fact, something that really hasn't been touched on very much is that probably many lives were saved because these wars were put, brought to a, an earlier end than they perhaps would have otherwise been. Um, but uh, yeah, the, this smear campaign has been really strong and really severe. I must say when it comes to the Swedish allegations, I always refer people to organizations like Women Against Rape, who spoke out about this 10 years ago. Uh, people like Naomi Wolf, who is probably the world's foremost expert on survivors of, of rape and sexual abuse and so on. She spoke out against this. She, she saw right through it right from the beginning, as did a lot of these other organizations like Code Pink and so on. And it, it, I find it really quite distressing sometimes when I come across some people who are going, oh no, he's a rapist, but then they refuse to read those documents and those researched articles from those women who are experts in the field. But personally, I do, from what I can gather, we're over that hump and it is now all about he endangered lives. And we really need to be campaigning on that, finding the, finding the, uh, I, could, I, I can usually only find quotes and articles where I'd like to get to the source documents, the court transcripts, the, you know, Robert Gates presentation to Congress and stuff like that. Um, has anybody got anything? Would you like to wrap up, anybody? Uh, James Dan. It's, it's, just an, it's just an observation. Uh, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but whenever I am involved with a discussion like this one or I go along to one of these um, rallies outside the town hall, what I notice is that there are almost no young people involved. And it seems to me that... And I, I don't know how to do it. I really don't. But it seems to me that somehow or other we have to make young people realise that Julian fate um, has implications for themselves in their own life. In the same way that this coronavirus pandemic, I think, is making everyone rethink a lot of the a lot of the um, conventional wisdom they've had about a whole range of different things. And I think that somehow or other climate change and the pandemic need to be linked to the young people to the notion that we need to be provided with accurate information about what is going on in our world in order for democracy to function properly and i'm i'm distressed i suppose that there are virtually no young voices at least not that i'm aware of that are speaking out in defense of julian and i think somehow or other we've got to engage young people I don't know how you do it, but I think it needs to happen. I, I think it's I think it's Facebook, James, um, because from what I uh, can see, that's where uh, young people young people get their news from social media, predominantly Facebook, and um, and so they're susceptible to fake news uh, on Facebook. So we need a we need a media campaign. A Facebook campaign that actually presents uh, some factual material and also puts to them in a way that uh, uh, they understand that, it, that that appeals to them about why this is important for their generation and subsequent generations uh, because they're, they're not reading newspapers. That's a really interesting point and, uh, and I'm, I'm not really on the pulse with these things because I'm a middle-aged person but I understand Instagram is, is the new platform, uh, which, and from my limited experience with Instagram, it's just virtually memes and squares. Paul, are you more familiar with Instagram? I know I stayed away from Instagram, but I, I think you're right. Instagram is just one picture after another after another. Okay, well, maybe, that's, maybe that should be our next campaign move, a whole bunch of uh, Facebook squares with quotes and facts and stuff. Um, I, I agree with what Mary said. The, the reason why it is important, that needs to be drawn out and probably made easy to understand. So it, it doesn't involve having to read a 1,000-word article, but, but just quickly understand why this is important. Mm. Well, thank you, everybody. On that note, we've got to three o'clock. Thank you, everybody, for participating today and also especially our speakers for their insights and understanding of what, what this is. And 
Uh, I think we've come up with a few great ideas there that we can work on for how this campaign moves along. So uh, give yourself all a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.